I am today going to tell you about the work that we've been doing in the last uh, four years since I set up the lab. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about published work to kind of introduce um, uh, the work that we are doing and, and the setup uh, that or, or the type of approach that we're taking um, to then move into unpublished work and um, things that I've gotten quite excited about. Um, our brain is composed of billions of neurons, they all connect to each other, but I believe that to understand how a brain functions, we should maybe first walk and then try to learn how to run. In other words, um, I think it's important to try to understand the basic mechanisms of synaptic transmission to then try to move into more complex systems and how molecular <coughs> mechanisms of synaptic transmission um, can shape information flow throughout entire processes. Um, to illustrate the importance of, of synaptic transmission to an organism, I brought a uh, movie of Drosophila flies in which we acutely inactivated synaptic transmission using a mutation in the dynamin gene. And you can see that these flies very quickly undergo behavioral changes. They will um, uh, become paralyzed, they undergo seizures, and eventually after a while, if we, if we keep on blocking synaptic transmission, they will, of course, die. Um, the importance of synaptic transmission is further underscored by the numerous neurological and psychiatric disorders that arise from um, imbalances in neuronal communication. And so we hope that by understanding the mechanisms of how synapses are communicating with one another, we will also be able to gain insight into how these diseases are coming about. In fact, um, while Many of these diseases, schizophrenia, autism, Parkinson's disease, have actually been linked to dysfunction of synapses or Im imbalances in synaptic transmission. There's very little known about the molecular mechanisms by which these proteins that have been implicated in these diseases are having an impact on the release process. And the main focus of my lab is actually to understand or, or to, to scrutinize mechanisms that are um, put in place or, or that are impacting on the one hand synaptic transmission and on the other hand neurological diseases in order to try to make causal links between these, um, between these two biological processes. So synapses release neurotransmitters by virtue of the use of this, is this a laser pointer maybe? There on the, this thing here? Ah there, okay. Thank you. So synapses release neurotransmitters by virtue of, of fusing these small synaptic vesicles with the membrane. Uh, they make a fusion pore and then neurotransmitters are released to bind to postsynaptic receptors and then they will transmit the signal. I'm sure all of you know this very well. But um, these synaptic vesicles are very important for this process because when you generate mutants in which there are no such synaptic vesicles, then synapses don't release neurotransmitters anymore. And this is actually an image taken from one of those flies that was undergoing paralysis <coughs> in the first slide. The synaptic vesicles um, are organized within the synaptic terminals in uh, what is called functional vesicle pools. Um, I think the importance of that is maybe a little bit overstated, but that's not that important. What is important is that um, the modulation of various aspects of the synaptic vesicle cycle will shape the amount of neurotransmitter release that the synapse can, um, can release. And there are uh, different aspects of the synaptic vesicle cycle where synaptic vesicles fuse and there's a cohort of proteins involved in the fusion and, and the regulation of fusion of these synaptic vesicles with the plasma membrane. Um, upon high frequency stimulation and the use of many of these vesicles in the release process, there will be um, endocytosis of synaptic vesicles at the synapse proper where a flat piece of membrane is actually shaped into a small synaptic vesicle of very defined size. Now you can think this is a trivial thing, but if you think about it, it's not that trivial because these synaptic vesicles that are being formed at this stage, <coughs> they need to contain all the synaptic vesicle proteins that they need to fuse at this site again. At the same time, they need to be of a very defined size because if they're too big or too small, the amount of neurotransmitters that they are releasing at that stage is not normal anymore. So the shape and the contents of the synaptic vesicles need to be very well controlled. And this is a process that is called synaptic vesicle endocytosis, where again, a very large number of synaptic vesicle proteins, um, as well as synaptic proteins in general, are being involved in. 
Um, finally, these vesicles need to be recycled, um, and there's actually very little known about what happens with the synaptic vesicle once it's pinched off from this synaptic membrane to it being brought back to the release sites. So there's a fair amount of knowledge on these two processes, but the recycling of these synaptic vesicles and how that is organized is much more enigmatic. What I'll tell you about um, today are our ongoing efforts to identify novel components of the synaptic transmission machinery. Uh, these are um, several genetic screens that we are um, conducting in Drosophila, uh, which are fruit flies, um, in order to identify novel components of the release process. Then I will tell you about one of those proteins that we have identified in these genetic screens. Um, this is a protein that we named Skywalker. The reason that we named it this is will, will, will become clear in a second. Um, but uh, to give away the punchline, this protein is regulating how synaptic vesicles are trafficking within the nerve terminal and is actually, as far as I know, the first protein that is involved in the regulation of this trafficking from endocytic to exocytic zones. And lastly, I will tell you about uh, ongoing work on a Parkinson-related protein, LARC, um, and its direct role in the regulation of synaptic vesicle recycling. So, to get started, uh, we have conducted two different genetic approaches in order to identify novel components of the release machinery. Um, and in one such approach, we, re we reasoned, rather than screening the whole genome uh, using RNAi or, or other um, measures, why don't we uh, start off from phenotypes in humans, from um, actual genes that we know affect or cause neurological or psychiatric diseases in humans, take those genes, identify the fruit fly homologs, knock them down in the nervous system and see to what extent they are actually affecting uh, specific aspects of uh, synaptic release. Um, and so we have conducted this screen, we uh, identified 165 different proteins that we knocked down in the nervous system, 50 of them showed specific behavioral defects and we, con we continued with those 50 in looking at synaptic morphology defects, at the recycling of synaptic vesicles using fluorescent molecules and also a number of other phenotypes. And as you can see, if every blue box here uh, indicates that there's a significant difference from control. There are um, actually almost all of these 50 genes that we identified to cause behavioral defects when knocked down in the nervous system also uh, show functional or morphological defects at the neuromuscular junction in Drosophila larvae, suggesting that there's a good correlation between these two phenotypes. And I'll come back to this later. In another approach, um, we have uh, conducted an unbiased forward genetic screen um, and the reasoning behind this is that um, we didn't really want to be biased essentially in what we wanted to uh, identify. We didn't want to go and pre-select a number of genes and then go and test whether they have an effect on the release process. We just wanted to um, feed um, animals chemical mutagens and then see which ones of these chemically induced mutations would affect uh, synaptic transmission. The way that we did this was we used a genetic trick that has been developed by Barry Dixon and Tom Schwartz, which allowed us to generate fruit flies that have homozygous mutant dyes in heterozygous bodies. The reason to do that is, is that a mutation that affects synaptic transmission, we would expect to be lethal. But now by generating this mutation only homozygous in the eye, these animals will survive because only their eyes are homozygous mutant and their bodies are heterozygous. But we still have a homozygous mutant tissue that allows us to screen for defects in synaptic transmission, which are these mutant photoreceptors. So we used a very simple electrophysiological assay, which is called an electroretinogram, where you essentially poke one electrode in the eye and one in the thorax, and you measure potential differences between the two while you flash um, a short burst of light. And so what you can see are these peaks here and here, as well as a depolarization of the photoreceptor layer. And when these peaks are gone, the postsynaptic cells are not responding, which is a good indication that there's a defect in synaptic transmission, like in this mutant, for example. This gives you a short overview of the screen that we have uh, performed on the X chromosome. We have also screened, both in my own lab as well as a postdoc in Hugo's lab, uh, all the other chromosome arms. Um, on the X chromosome, we identified 160 of such mutants that lack on and off transients and combined with our mapping efforts that include uh, whole genome sequencing as well as classical mapping approaches, we have been able to identify 
a cohort of genes, some of, some of which are shown here on this slide, to give you a bit of an idea of the, of the type of genes that uh, can come out of such a screening approach. So obviously, um, ion channels, which makes sense, cell adhesion molecules, if, the, if the, the neurons are not properly connected to their postsynaptic targets, they of course won't activate these postsynaptic cells, so this is maybe a group that is also quite expected. A fairly decently sized group of genes that affect mitochondrial transport or mitochondrial function. Initially, we were a little bit surprised to find these um, mutants, but in retrospect, this of course makes sense. You need mitochondria to generate energy for these vesicles to keep on going. Um, a couple of genes that we have categorized under neuronal degeneration, but I mean, of course, these genes, their sole purpose is not to cause neuronal degeneration, right? So they probably have other roles. And then a large group um, that is involved in synaptic vesicle trafficking, um, genes like synaptotagmin or synaptogenin, which have been slammed to death uh, in the literature and, and have been studied very well in, in terms of their function in the exo or endocytic release process as well as a number of um, more unanticipated or novel genes. Tweak, which is a gene that we think is involved in regulating phosphoinositide levels at the synapse, and these lipids are very important in the synaptic vesicle cycle again. L3, which is an elongator component, so it's supposed to be functioning in the nucleus, but our data actually indicates that this protein in neurons is present in the cytoplasm, and is regulating synaptic processes quite directly. But I won't talk about that. If you're, if you're interested, we can talk about this later. Um, and Skywalker, which is a protein that I'll talk about um, right now. So the Skywalker mutations, we identified multiple alleles in this gene. We be actually became interested in this particular mutation because um, these animals show a very peculiar phenotype. The mutant larvae, the mutant Drosophila larvae, they all point up their heads towards the sky. So normally they nicely lay you know, down flat on a, on, a, on a plate. These guys, before they die, they paralyze, they all become stiff and they all sit like that. We first wanted to call it Viagra, but you know, maybe that's not a, not a good choice. <laughs> um, but so this is a very peculiar phenotype, and so we decided to study this further. Now, we decided to study this further in Drosophila because this protein, and I'll tell you later what the protein is, is very well conserved between species from C. elegans all the way to humans, and actually this is true for almost all proteins involved in synaptic transmission. On average, proteins involved in synaptic transmission in Drosophila are identical for more than 75% at the primary amino acid level, suggesting that the basic mechanisms and pathways involved in synaptic transmission in fruit flies are conserved in humans as well. So I think that the findings that we make in, in, Drosoph in, in Drosophila are not you know, something specific for a fruit fly. These mechanisms seem to be uh, conserved across species. So, continuing to study this, this mutation in, in, uh, in Drosophila larvae, we decided to take these larvae, cut them open, lay them open, and then look at the neuromuscular junction. Why the neuromuscular junction? Not because it's the most relevant system to, to understand uh, central, brain or, or, or central brain function, just because it's a very accessible system with very large synaptic terminals, and it allows us to combine a great number of different technologies that will eventually allow us to um, get a better handle on what the protein in question is doing. And so we started out by um, looking at what we call FM143 diaptake assays, which are essentially assays that allow us to look at the recycling of synaptic vesicles. After cutting these larvae open and, and exposing the neuromuscular junction, you incubate these synaptic terminals in the presence of this dye, FM143, stimulate either with KCL or direct nerve stimulation and look at the uptake of new synaptic vesicles that now contain the dye into the nerve terminal. You wash, you wash excess dye away and then you can image the fluorescence. When you do this in a wild type, you can see that there's a ring-like structure that forms which is composed of thousands of synaptic vesicles that are all labeled by this fluorescent dye. When we do the same in Skywalker mutants, you can see that there's clear uptake into these synaptic terminals, but to our surprise, we saw that these, this dye never really localizes into these nice donut-like structures, but in punctate structures. This is a phenotype that up to then we really hadn't seen much. Uh, it's a very peculiar phenotype and it drew our attention even more, so not only this weirdo um, you know, behavioral phenotype was interesting, the paralysis of course was interesting as well, 
this phenotype was interesting uh, too, of course. So we, we pursued this mutant further. This is the quantification of the amount of blebs that you see in the nerve terminal. And we continue to characterize the, the nature of these structures that, that you see here in this uh, dioptake assay in more detail using electron tomography, which, is, um, which, which allows you to look at electron microscopy resolution, but then in three dimensions. You essentially make a thick section of your boot on and then you turn it around in the electron, micro, uh, in the electron microscope. Um, and from that you can, you know, back uh, calculate the, the, the three-dimensional structure within that volume that you were imaging. So when we do that in controls, you can see this is part of such a synaptic boot on at the neuromuscular junction. The blue is showing the membrane. You can see many of these green labeled here synaptic vesicles, a number of larger structures as well. But when we do the same in the Skywalker mutants, you can see that there is a large accumulation of very large uh, cisternal endosomal like structures. We don't know what the nature of these things are yet, but I'll come back to that. So this indicates that in Skywalker mutants, upon stimulation, very large cisternal endosomal like structures are forming. This is something that is sometimes also seen in other endocytic mutants, but in other endocytic mutants, this assay doesn't show that particular phenotype. You don't get these blebs that are concentrating within the nerve terminal. So we wanted to see whether these structures are participating in the synaptic vesicle cycle. And not only just participating, we actually wanted to find out whether these large structures directly form at the membrane um, upon endocytosis. And um, by extension, whether these structures directly fuse with the membrane for exocytosis. And we performed a number of assays for that. We started out by uh, photoconverting this fluorescence that we got by take up of FM143 into the nerve terminal. Um, by adding DAB and shining light, which will uh, create reactive oxygen species, and the DAB will precipitate within the structures that it was where the FM143 was present. And I hope you can appreciate in these uh, transmission electron microscope sections that many of these large structures or membranes are intensely labeled by these precipitates. Also, small synaptic vesicles are labeled, um, so it's not only that the dye is present in these big structures, but the data do indicate that these large structures are taking part in the synaptic vesicle cycle because else the FM143 would never end up in them. So now we wanted to find out are these structures forming directly at the membrane or are they intermediate stations in which synaptic vesicles are coming and are pinching off again and uh, making small synaptic vesicles again. So we did this in, in a number of different uh, ways. The top is just showing a quantification of, of the data that I showed you before. It's not important. Um, and so we, we use the paradigm, a stimulation paradigm, that is known to not induce bulk endocytosis. Bulk endocytosis would lead to the formation of these large cisternal-like structures at the membrane. But we figured that if we give a low-frequency stimulation that does not induce these large structures in wild-type synapses, then we can see whether in Skywalker mutants we can still get the FM143 dye to be taken up into these uh, sub-butonic structures. And as you can see, you know, obviously in controls you get dye uptake during this low frequency stimulation paradigm, but in Skywalker mutants, both alleles, you still get an accumulation of these blebs, suggesting that um, paradigms that we know induce bulk uh, do not induce bulk endocytosis are, not, are, are still leading to the formation of these blebs. So new synaptic vesicles that form in Skywalker mutants end up in these cisternal-like structures, and likely these structures don't form directly at the plasma membrane. We also um, used a large bulky molecule that is known to be specifically internalized into um, bulk endocytosing membranes, like dextran 10 or 30 kilodaltons. This is a bit of a tricky experiment, and, and if you need some details on this, I can give them to you. But when we induce bulk endocytosis uh, chemically, you can see that this dye is internalized into synaptic boutons, but in Skywalker mutants, you don't get internalization. Again, indicating that large cisternal-like structures in Skywalker mutants are not forming directly at the plasma membrane. Finally, we quantified the number of omega profiles, which would indicate the formation of a new vesicle at the plasma membrane in our electron tomograms, as well as in our electron microscopy sections. And we don't really see an accumulation of large, more than 80 nanometer, omega structures at the plasma membrane, again indicating that, um, or, or these, these three pieces of evidence would indicate that in Skywalker mutants, synaptic vesicles are 
normally incise when they form at the plasma membrane and then fuse with these larger structures as opposed to, to these large structures directly forming at the plasma membrane. Conversely, we measured uh, spontaneous vesicle fusions in order to assess whether these large structures directly fuse with the plasma membrane. And these minis are essential, or, or these little peaks that you see here, are actually elicit, elicited by one single synaptic vesicle fusing with the plasma membrane and releasing its neurotransmitters. The bigger that this vesicle is going to be, the more neurotransmitters that can be packaged into it, the bigger this mini response can be, right? So if these big vesicles directly fuse with the plasma membrane, you expect very big minis. If they are the same size as in controls, you expect the same sized minis. And so, as you can see here, the minis are exactly the same in size as in controls in Skywalker mutants, again, indicating that these large structures are also not fusing with the plasma membrane. Uh, finally, we also quantified the number of large cisterna-like structures directly at release sites, which are marked by these electron-dense T's, and we don't really see an accumulation of large cisternae at the active zones, at the sites where vesicles need to fuse. So both these pieces of evidence would indicate that in Skywalker mutants, synaptic vesicles are also not direct, these large synaptic vesicles are not directly fusing with the membrane. Finally, we also did uh, more detailed electron tomography of these cisternal structures, and you can see that they are decorated with these small uh, 40 nanometer in diameter structures, which would again indicate that at these sites, synaptic vesicles can fuse or go um, from these structures. Okay, so by now probably you're you know, wondering what Skywalker is. So we mapped this gene and, um, oh actually, sorry, I need to quickly tell you this too. So we, we wanted to know what the molecular nature of these structures was. So we double labeled them with endosomal markers to determine whether they are bona fide endosomes that would be part of the synaptic vesicle cycle. And as you can see here, when we do double labeling with an endosomal marker, FYVE, GFP, but also other markers for endosomes, you can see that there's a co-localization between the FM143 that is internalized into these subbutonic structures in butons of Skywalker mutants, as well as the FYVE GFP, indicating that these structures harbor endosomal-like features. And also, for the first time, actually um, implicating an endosomal intermediate in the synaptic vesicle cycle. Um, this is not only so for FIVE GFP, also for RAP5 and RAP4 GFP, which are also endosomal markers. And this is also true for a synaptic vesicle marker, when you stimulate and look at where the synaptic vesicle markers, like synaptotagmin, but also other ones, are localized, you can actually also find them inside these structures following stimulation of a Skywalker mutant. So combined, these data actually indicate that the structures in Skywalker mutants are bona fide endosomes and that in these mutants, synaptic vesicles are pushed through an endosomal compartment. Okay, so what is Skywalker? Well, we mapped the gene and we found out that uh, it encodes a protein with a TBC domain and a TLDC domain. Now, the combination of these two domains is very commonly found in GAP proteins or GTPS activating proteins. And GTPS activating proteins are involved in vesicle trafficking, and I'll come back to that in a second. I first very quickly want to uh, give you that this protein is present in the nervous system, is present at synaptic boutons of the neuromuscular junction, um, and we show this both with an antibody as well as with a genomically tagged GFP uh, protein. So um, Skywalker is a neuronally and synaptically present uh, GAP protein. So what are GAPs doing? Well, GAPs activate the GTPS activity of a small RAB GTPS such that it becomes inactive again. A RAB GTPS act RAP GTP bound protein is active and will bind effectors and mediate trafficking events in the cell. And you can see here the different RAP proteins that are implicated in vesicle trafficking steps. Uh, RAP3, for example, uh, in, in, in trafficking from the Golgi to the membrane. RAP5 in, in trafficking from the membrane to the endosome and so on and so forth. Um, Honestly, there's fairly little known about what these reps are really doing in vivo, where they are expressed, whether they are really present in all different cell types in, in, in the body. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, when you make a, a, a grouping of all the data on rep proteins, you will find that they can mediate different trafficking steps. That's not to say that different reps in different cell types or different, different cell compartments might even mediate different trafficking steps as well. But nonetheless, um, what our mapping data indicate is that 
in this gap mutant, you will have too much of this, right? Now, of course, we don't know which wrap Skywalker would be activating. We don't know which wrap GTP would be overactive in a Skywalker mutant. To identify potential Skywalker targets, we um, made use of a uh, collection of dominant active wrap GTPs that have been generated by Matt Scott and Hugo Balance Lab, and that, allows us, that allowed us to express um, almost all the wraps that exist in the Drosophila genome under dominant active form in the nervous system. And so when doing so and then assessing whether any of those would phenocopy our Skywalker mutants, we would end up with a list of candidate wrap genes that could be activated by our Skywalker gap, right? If this doesn't occur, you have too much of that. So we express this and we see which ones of those phenocopy or Skywalker mutant, and we found three, rep 5, rep 23, and rep 35, that also lead to an accumulation of FM143 dye into these subplutonic structures. So this would indicate that these are good candidates um, as Skywalker substrates, and we tested them in vitro by purifying both Skywalker um, in uh, expressed in bacterial cells, as well as rep 5, rep 23, and rep 35, throw them together and see how efficient they can now hydrolyze GTP. This is the basal GTP hydrolysis activity in the example that I'm showing you here for RAP35. When you add Skywalker, you can see that it becomes more efficient and they will more quickly go and hydrolyze GTP. These are the, the enzymatic efficiencies. You can see that RAP35 is the most efficient. Now, of course, it's not because RAP35 is here on top of the list that RAP35 is the only and um, best in vivo substrate for Skywalker enzymatic activity. You don't know what the peak activity of these individual RAP GTPases would be in vivo. Maybe this particular activity for RAP5 is way more than enough for what this protein actually needs in vivo. So in the end, we would still now need to go in vivo and actually test which one of these three is a bona fide Skywalker substrate. What these data indicate is that in vitro, Skywalker has the capability of activating the GTPS activity of um, of these wraps. So we did genetic interaction experiments where we uh, either expressed a dominant negative RAP35 or took a single copy of RAP35 away using two different uh, alleles and tested again this FM143 dioptic assay that, we, uh, that I showed you before. Where in Skywalker mutants you see the accumulation of these dots inside the synaptic boutons and you can see that when you express a dominant negative, which is now the opposite, right? You try to bring the balance back by removing the active rep 35, 5 or 23, you can see that when you do that, you can rescue the phenotype completely, <coughs> at least at this level. And interestingly, some of these animals, whereas Skywalker homozygous mutants die, all of them, some of these animals now even survive. They're not super happy and they're not prancing around, you know, making a party, but these guys are definitely running around they and, and they don't have this strange behavior either anymore. So they will keep on crawling, they pupate, and some of the flies will come out. They are behaviorally quite challenged, but um, some of them make it, which is quite a difference from, from uh, the Skywalker mutants alone. What is interesting is um, we didn't pursue rep 23, and I'll show you later why, but when we do the same experiment with rep 5, you see that you still have the Skywalker phenotype. So while rep 35 can completely suppress the phenotype at the level of the synapse in Skywalker mutants, Loss of rep 5 function doesn't, right? And it's actually even worse. These guys are super sick and are very hard to get. So dominant negative rep 5 makes things even worse. So these data would suggest that at least at the level of this particular phenotype, rep 35 is a bona fide Skywalker substrate and mediates uh, the trafficking of synaptic vesicles via an endosomal compartment. This is summarized here. The next question, of course, is, well, what are the functional consequences of having synaptic vesicles trafficking via an endosomal compartment. My first idea would be, well, if all these vesicles are now pushed through this endosomal compartment, you make things much less efficient, it's going to slow down things, the synapses are going to be sick, you won't get a lot of neurotransmitter release in the end. Well, we actually got quite the opposite. When you look in a control, you stimulate the motor nerve and you measure uh, in two electrode voltage clamp how much current you need to inject into the current to keep the voltage of the muscle constant. You can see here that in controls you get such an amplitude. In Skywalker mutants this amplitude is doubled, which indicates that the amount of neurotransmitters that are released in Skywalker mutants is doubled. Right? This is quantified here. Um, 
So here, this is the amount of synaptic or the amount of quanta, which tends to correlate to the amount of synaptic vesicles that is being released when you give such a single stimulation. You can see that this is also doubled in the Skywalker mutants. Okay, this is a feature of synaptic vesicles traveling via an endosome because when we do the same experiment in RAP35 dominant active or RAP35 dominant active expressing mutants, remember, in these two conditions, synaptic vesicles were traveling through an endosomal compartment as well, we also get an increase in the amount of neurotransmitters. So when synaptic vesicles travel via an endosomal compartment, they seem to become much better. You seem to get much, a much easier time to release neurotransmitters. Um, why is that? What happens at the synapse to, to yield much more neurotransmitters? Well, we tested two things. On the one hand, we tested, is there an increase in calcium? If you get increased calcium influx, you would increase the release probability. You would get more vesicles fusing. But we used uh, GCAMP imaging here to assess this under different stimulation conditions, and we don't really see much of a difference in the amount of calcium that flows into the nerve terminal. So calcium influx is not effective in Skywalker mutants, at least not under the conditions that we have tested. <clears throat> what is actually affected is the size of the readily releasable pool. Now, the name is maybe not that important, but the concept is essentially that synaptic vesicles are sitting ready to fuse right, at the active zone. And when you stimulate really hard, these vesicles are the first ones to be delivered and, 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 and to release neurotransmitters. And so you can measure how many of these vesicles are sitting ready and like to fuse um, with the presynaptic membrane by giving a very short pulse of very high frequency stimulation and measure the total amount of neurotransmitters that's being released during the short stimulation bout. When you do that in controls, you can see here the black peaks. You see that you very quickly depress the amount of neurotransmitters that's being released because, of course, you've depleted the readily releasable pool. There are no vesicles ready. And you only get very small peaks, which is the delivery of novel vesicles to release sites, right? And, and you can quantify this from the slope of this curve here. This is the, the, the total amount of neurotransmitters released over time, essentially. When we do the same thing in Skywalker mutants, you can appreciate from this, this raw data trace that there's a dramatic increase in the amount of neurotransmitters that can be released during the short stimulation bout, which indicates that the number of synaptic vesicles that's ready to fuse in these Skywalker mutants is dramatically increased. We also tested this by dumping sucrose onto the, on, onto the neuromuscular junction. Don't ask me how this works. I think it shrinks the nerve terminal or something, and then these vesicles are being released. This is a standard approach that many people use to measure the readily releasable pool. But while maybe we don't perfectly understand how this works, you can see that also using this established assay, we in Skywalker mutants also get a dramatic increase in the amount of neurotransmitters that's being released. So Skywalker mutants have an increased amount of neurotransmitters that are being released when you give a single pulse and also when you then go and measure the total amount of vesicles that sits ready to fuse with the membrane you find an increase in that parameter as well. So why do we think that is? What's, what's the hypothesis behind this? What's, what's the model that, that we then propose? Well, in Skywalker mutants, because of excess RAP GTP, RAP35 GTP, these vesicles end up in this endosomal compartment. And endosomes are known to be sorting stations for lipids and, and, and proteins. We think that in Skywalker mutants, the trafficking of the synaptic vesicles to this endosomal compartment allows excess or, or more efficient sorting of dysfunctional synaptic vesicle proteins, such that those are sorted away to the lysosome for degradation whereas functional synaptic vesicle proteins are repackaged onto a synaptic vesicle that can then be brought back to the release pool. And if that, ju just think of it like that, right? Synaptic vesicle contains 50 synaptotagmins, for example, that it needs for fusion. 20, 30, 40 of them are not very functional and have been used 50 times over and by now have been, you know, uh, ab excuse me, have been abused and, and, and have become partially dysfunctional they are sitting in the way of the functional synaptotagmins that need to make a complex here for fusion. And so if you remove those, and even if you don't add new synaptotagmins to the synaptic vesicle, the chance that you make a complex with a functional synaptic synaptotagmin protein will be more efficient, more, uh, <coughs> will happen more readily, such that this vesicle will now harbor a larger uh, release probability. Of course, we wanted to test this directly rather than, you know, construing complicated models. Uh, you want to do an experiment. And so what we did was we did genetic interactions with the escort complex. Escort complexes are put in place 
to mediate the sorting of proteins from the endosome to the multivesicular body and then to the lysosome, right? So this is the protein complex or the protein complexes that recognize, for example, ubiquitinated proteins, will sort them into a multivesicular body and get rid of them, right? And so what we did was we took single copies of these escort components away in a Skywalker mutant background and tested two things. We tested first, are vesicles still traveling via an endosomal compartment? You would expect so. And secondly, we tested the amount of neurotransmitter release that we can get from these synaptic terminals. And you would expect that if you block this step, while vesicles are still traveling via an endosomal compartment, you would now reduce the amount of neurotransmitter release in a Skywalker mutant background. This looks like a complicated slide, but I'll quickly run you through it. It's, it's uh, quite doable, I think. Um, this is your wild type amount of neurotransmitter release. That's what you get in a Skywalker mutant. While heterozygosity for any of these escort components doesn't do anything to neurotransmitter release, they are able to suppress the increased neurotransmitter release in a Skywalker mutant back to normal levels, right? So our prediction is true. If you block this step, you, re you reduce the amount of neurotransmitters that you get in a Skywalker mutant, while, and while synaptic vesicles are still traveling via these endosomal compartments. To further um, test our model, we also generated an artificial escort substrate. And we tested how efficient this artificial escort substrate would be degraded in a Skywalker mutant background. And so for that, we generated a synaptobrevin, or a VAMP protein, which is a synaptic vesicle protein, with a ubiquitin tail on it, which would be recognized by the escort machinery, as well as an HA, so that we can recognize it ourselves as well. We express this in a nerve terminal or in neurons and test it where this thing localizes. It's a perfectly localized synaptic vesicle protein. It behaves like a synaptic vesicle protein. We did lots of different control experiments. And then we test it to see whether this ubiquitinated synaptic vesicle protein in a Skywalker mutant where it would travel more readily via this endosomal compartment, whether it would be degraded more efficiently. These data are shown here. This is our construct without the ubiquitin as a control expressed in synaptic boutons at the neuromuscular junction. You can see that there's already a dramatic reduction in the amount of ubiquitinated synaptobrevin at the neuromuscular junction, indicating that also in controls, this thing is recognized as a bona fide escort substrate and is being degraded, indicating that also in wild types, endosomal trafficking is important to get rid of dysfunctional proteins. When we do the same experiment in Skywalker mutants, here you see the presence of this synaptobrevin in a Skywalker mutant. This is reduced even further compared to controls. And interestingly, when you take a copy of the escort away again, you can partially rescue the phenotype, right? So these data indicate that when you um, get dysfunctional synaptic vesicle proteins onto your synaptic vesicle, and this ends up in an endosomal compartment, that at this station, you can get sorting of these proteins such that they can be degraded to improve the amount of functional synaptic vesicles in the nerve terminal. Now, and this is just shown here schematically again. Now, this, I think, has implications for neurological diseases and actually also for psychiatric diseases. Um, so, this is a mechanism by which neurons can maintain the functionality of their synapses over long periods of time these neurons tend to be located very far away from the cell bodies and they need to have specialized mechanisms by which they can rejuvenate their protein pool and also their synaptic vesicle pool locally and efficiently. And this would be a mechanism by which they can do this. In many neurological diseases where neurotransmitter release is um, gradually being disrupted, this could be a mechanism that could be employed in order to try to improve synaptic transmission or improve the vesicle pool to the extent that you can reestablish normal amounts of neurotransmitter release. Conversely, two recent publications have identified mutations in the human Skywalker protein, TBC1D24, and those mutations are implicated in epilepsy. So when you go the other way, when you have too much neurotransmitter release, apparently this seems to be leading to seizures and to <coughs> epileptic phenotypes. So I think the fine balance of this trafficking of synaptic vesicles via this endosomal compartment endows the synapse to regulate the amount of neurotransmitter release, but is also important in order to mediate proper um, information transfer in neuronal circuits.
And with that, I would like to um, mention the people that have conducted this work. Uh, Valerie Atroven and um, uh, Jari Kasparovic are two graduate students that worked um, very hard on our Skywalker project together with Sabine, um, our lab manager, and Katarzyna Miskiewicz, who is an expert uh, postdoc doing all the EM in the lab. Uh, all the EM that I showed you was done by her, including the tomography and everything else. The project on LARC is a larger collaboration between different groups, uh, including the group of Bart Stroper, Chris Gevaert, who is uh, performing the mass spectro spectrometry in, uh, in, at the VIB in, in Ghent, and Johnson & Johnson, where Christophe and Dieter have been instrumental in setting up uh, the in vitro phosphorylation assays uh, for LARC. And then the tubulation assays were performed in collaboration with Matthew Holt and Geert van den Bogaert um, in the laboratory of Reinhard Jan. And then, yeah, obviously, these people for sending us very precious reagents. Thank you.